if we start with the, the fund size, sitting at about 856 million rand, it was launched in December 2007. Perhaps you can just give us the overarching mandate of this fund as it stands. Sure, Bronwyn. Um, the Emerging Markets Flexible Fund was launched by Coronation basically to act as um, an investment vehicle for South African investors, retail investors, to enter um, and get access to emerging markets. Now, there was a choice between launching a, an equity-only fund, um, but it was decided that uh, it would be more prudent to allow to, to launch rather an asset allocation, tactical asset allocation fund, so that if you're in a situation where emerging market valuations are very stretched, uh, the fund has got the flexibility to hold large amounts of cash if necessary. But pretty much over time, you would expect this fund to be 85 to 90 percent invested in equities. Well, well, let's look at your equity allocation, and China makes up a significant pro pro proportion of that, sitting at some 30 percent of your equity allocation, which is now at about almost 89 percent in total. Yes, that's correct. Look, I suppose you should look at it in, in, in context. So China at 30% of fund. Uh, we're not index uh, cognizant managers, but if you look at the Emerging Markets Index, it's about 20% um, China allocation. So we, we are pretty well overweight relative to, to the index. Uh, but it's, it's mostly because we're finding a phenomenal number of very good quality undervalued stocks in China. Now, anyone who has a reasonable knowledge of Coronation's investment philosophy will be aware that we look for businesses that will deliver very good returns uh, over a, over a long-term four to five-year holding period. And we, we, we try and understand the businesses really well uh, and purchase ones that are trading well below what we think they're worth. Um, now, whether they get to that fair value in in six months or one year or three years is, is really not something that we think we can predict and I don't think anyone can. Uh, but looking at the Chinese market, there are certainly a number of very good quality stocks um, that we've got in the fund. And it, it's not just a few holdings. We, the, the largest holding in the fund um, is, is a company called Great Wall Motors. Uh, now, Great Wall is dominant in pickup trucks and um, SUVs. They only launched an SUV business about four years ago in China and they already have sort of 20% market share. Uh, and in an industry which historically has been pretty poor quality worldwide, they, they uh, get very decent margins and they generate a reasonable amount of cash and they're busy expanding capacity. Now, the Chinese market is very underpenetrated for, for cars uh, and you can probably get 10, 15, maybe 20 years uh, of, uh, of very large passenger volume growth um, for vehicles. So this sort of business we think um, over the long term will perform phenomenally and you can buy it on sort of eight or nine times uh, this next year's earnings, which by any standards uh, is incredibly cheap. Your South African equity exposure is also relatively high, sitting at just over 7%. I see the only South African stock in your top 10, though, is NASPAS, and uh, that uh, constituting about 2.9% of the fund. NASPAS, why is that because of the, the Chinese affiliation that you've got it so high on the radar screen? Actually, actually surprisingly not. Um, uh, for you know, for for listeners, uh, the Naspers owns a business in China called Tencent, which is a sort of gaming and instant messaging business. Uh, and if you look at uh, a, a look through of Naspers valuation, the Tencent probably accounts for about thirty percent of the current market capitalization of of, of Naspers. Um, and, and yet, we actually think that Tencent is is expensive. But if you look at the businesses making up Naspers, um, there's a, a whole host of, of phenomenal assets. The the pay TV business. Uh, in South Africa and in Africa is, is really one of the highest quality TV businesses you can purchase anywhere in the world. Um, there's a whole host of other assets. There's a, a Russian internet business. Uh, I mean, we think that Naspers is probably worth 30 to 40 percent more than the current share price. Um, and this is in spite of the fact that a large portion of the valuation is made up of, of a business which we think is slightly overvalued as well. In, in terms of the overall South African allocation, 7.5-8 percent is, is probably uh, in line with the Emerging Markets Index. Once again, it's not really something that we're worried about. Um, but it, if you looked at other emerging market funds, for example, who just purely track the index, they would probably also have a reasonable exposure to South Africa at, at around the same level as we do. Russia also on the radar screen, and that falls just below South Africa in your equity, as uh, asset, in your equity allocation. What excites you about the Russian story at this stage? Well, the Russian, Russian story is, is really twofold. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the, the BRICS, uh, yet the, the actual economic potential of Russia is very different from 
the rest of the, the countries making up that grouping. I mean, Brazil, India, and China um, are young, fast-growing countries. Uh, Russia is much older, it's a much more mature market, um, and it's also one that's going to struggle to, you know, with, with an aging population. But the, the, the bulk of our Russian exposure is actually in a business called Gazprom. Now, Gazprom is basically the largest uh, owner of the world's gas reserves. So they own, it's a government monopoly and it, it has uh, the bulk of Russia's gas reserves. Russia has about a quarter of the world's gas reserves uh, and they uh, supply a lot of Eastern and Western Europe's uh, natural gas needs. Now, natural gas is the main heating source for most of, uh, most of the countries in Europe. So they're, they're pretty much uh, close to having a monopoly on supply of, uh, of a very essential commodity to much of Europe. Now you can buy this business on five, six times earnings. Uh, it generates f a phenomenal amount of cash, and um, it, it really is our only major Russia holding. Uh, if you look at the rest of the Russian market, a lot of the very good businesses which you would like to own, um, particularly in the retail space, the retail businesses in Russia, the industry as a whole is very underpenetrated, and there's a few companies which are, which are consolidating and doing um, what pick and pay and, and I suppose checkers and, uh, and Woolworths have done in South Africa over the last 20 or 30 years in, in terms of clearing out the small mom and pop operators and, and, and moving to a formal retail market. Russia is very early on in that stage, but unfortunately the good businesses which you would like to own are trading at 20, 30 times um, earnings and they're too expensive to hold in our portfolios because we, we look very much at, at, um, at valuation. Suhail, just focusing on, on your top 10 stocks there, there seems to be no clear sector bias across emerging markets. Would that be a fair observation? No, it's, it's, it's a very accurate observation. Now, we, we, don't, um, we don't look at benchmarks in terms of countries. We don't look at benchmarks in terms of sector allocations. And, and we're somewhat spoiled uh, for choice in the sense that a South African fund manager really only has uh, four or five major sectors at which he can build up meaning, meaningful exposure. But when you're looking at the entire emerging markets universe, um, you, you, you've got a choice of several thousand stocks. So we, we probably have a preference for good quality consumer facing businesses because we believe these sort of businesses over the long term have shown to generate decent returns for shareholders. They uh, generate lots of cash and return that to shareholders and, and most of these businesses in emerging markets are fairly underpenetrated. Um, Retail, I mentioned in the case of Russia, it's a similar story in, in China, in Brazil, uh, both food retail and clothing retail. Uh, the uh, consumer facing businesses like uh, Coke bottlers and beer bottlers, all these businesses throughout emerging markets are very underpenetrated. So it, it doesn't look like we have a clear um, a, a bias, but we, we, we definitely look towards uh, having the bulk of the portfolio in these sort of quality type uh, businesses, but obviously. Uh, trying to make sure we get them at very reasonable prices as well. So, Hale, let, let's just focus on performance for a moment here. I, I look at 2009, sure. and again, just reiterating for the audience that your benchmark is the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. And if you look at your 2009 performance, you underperformed the benchmark by 0.2%, negligible. 2010, a 4% underperformance. Now, isn't that in a period when emerging markets were supposed to be striding? way ahead of any other market? Well, I, I suppose the answer to that is twofold. You must remember this fund year is never 100% invested. So if your benchmark is a 100% equity um, uh, benchmark, then if you're 80 to 90% invested throughout that period, you're naturally going to return 80 to 90% of the benchmark return, um, especially in this situation where cash is giving you e effectively nothing. Now, we don't have any um, uh, sort of fixed interest securities in, in the portfolio.